Hey everybody, welcome to the KLN Solar YouTube channel. You are joining us for episode one of our new series, Solar Pro Saturdays. Look for new video, hopefully every Saturday, covering a different topic, and let us know below in the comments anything that you think needs extra training or isn't covered well enough, uh, especially when it comes to equipment. Today we're covering microinverters versus optimized central inverters. So inverters 101, I'm sure most of you already know this, but solar systems produce energy at the panel level in DC. In the United States, our homes run on AC. All the inverter is doing is converting the produced energy from DC to AC for the home to use. How they go about doing that is what makes them different. So you have microinverters. With microinverter system, the individual microinverter is placed on the back of each panel. If system has 15 panels, you have 15 inverters. 50 panels, 50 inverters, and so on. Most commonly, you'll, you'll see the brand in phase when you're dealing with microinverters. What are optimized central inverters? Each panel has a power optimizer attached to it rather than an inverter. What these do is adjust the voltage to allow each panel to produce independently using a concept called uh, mean power point tracking. The energy remains in DC from the panel level and is fed at a high voltage where there's less resistance loss to the central inverter, which converts all of the energy produced in one place to AC. Most commonly with these, you'll see Solar Edge as the brand. So benefits, what are the benefits of microinverters? Um, with each panel's output, you're only feeding one inverter. So each panel's production is independent of each other entirely. There is no tying together when it comes to production. You have longer expected life. If you think about it, each inverter is processing significantly less energy. It's only processing the energy from one panel. That results in less heat, less wear and tear, longer expected lifespan, usually warranty for about 25 years. And if you do have inverter failure, it results in the loss of one individual panel or however many inverters you lose rather than the whole system. We'll discuss this topic further. What are some drawbacks of microinverters? First and foremost, the elephant in the room, they can be substantially more expensive, especially with larger systems. If we're talking a system that's got 50, 100, 150 panels, you have 50, 100, 150 inverters. That, that cost goes up quick. Uh, you typically have a lower conversion efficiency. Uh, you have more duplicity of equipment. That results in slightly less realized uh, energy production, meaning of the energy your, your system's producing, less of it is actually available for your home to use. They're more difficult and potentially expensive to repair if the inverter fails. That's because the inverter is located behind a panel on the roof somewhere. By Murphy's law, it never seems to be the panel that's on the outside of an array. Usually it's one that's in the middle, three or four rows in on some huge array, and you'd have to tunnel, you'd have to remove panels to get to that panel where the fault is um, in order to gain access to and replace that faulty equipment. Also, you're more li likely to require infrastructure upgrades, such as main panel upgrades. We'll talk about this a little bit more in sizing. And microinverters are prone to something called clipping, which we'll also talk about here in a bit. So when you're sizing a microinverter, you're looking at the individual panel size. Um, you're almost always gonna pick an inverter that is considerably smaller in AC rating than the panel's DC rating. Um, reason for that is if you have, let's say a 400 watt panel, it is hardly ever, if ever, going to produce 400 watts in the real world. That is its laboratory condition rating. Um, if it is north facing, east facing, west facing, even south facing with a bad tilt, if you have shading concerns, things like that, you're never at a truly optimal uh, orientation relative to the sun. You're not producing its actual sticker rating. So there's, there's no need to be all the way up at its DC rating. Uh, at the same time, uh, if you were to do that, the system's AC rating as a whole is the sum of the AC rating of each inverter. So you don't want to have too large of an, an inverter um, because that's going to make a very large AC rating for the system. That's when you need things like main panel upgrades. So you, oftentimes you'll see people use even smaller microinverters that are paired to panels uh, to reduce the system's AC rating and avoid those main panel upgrades. If you go too small, now we start having major clipping issues. So what is clip? Again, let's imagine you have a 400 watt panel. Uh, the microinverter that would be the proper size for that or most commonly picked for it has a maximum output of 324 watts. 
the majority of the time, as I mentioned, this 400 watt nameplate rated panel is not producing anything even close to 400 watts. But if at any point it's producing more than 324 watts, which is very, very possible, um, and even likely if it is a, a south facing panel in a southern state where you've got some good sun intensity, that additional energy, anything over the rating of the microinverter is lost, or we call it clipped. So let's look at a, uh, a case study. This is an actual project of mine from last year. It was a 16.8 kilowatt system using 400 watt panels. If you think about it, in the morning, the sun is to the east. And so the east facing panels are more productive. As the sun rises, you start to get a shared production. And in the afternoon, the west facing panels are more productive. So we're faced with a conundrum. Do we use larger microinverters to make sure that whatever side, when it's at its optimal production, uh, we are harvesting all of that energy that's producing? We want to minimize clipping. Do we want to do that? Absolutely. Does that force a main panel upgrade? Does that force some other infrastructure upgrade? You know, what is the trade off? Um, some places, we don't really have this in Florida, but I, I recently had a project up in Colorado where AC ratings cross jurisdictional limits, meaning that if we had, if I remember correctly, if it was above about 11 kilowatts, um, it was a wholesale net metering scheme. If it was below that, they got one for one. So now you have the trade-off using these same panels. You know, what's more advantageous? Um, if I use that lower rating, maybe I have a better scheme. Maybe I don't need to pay all this money for a main panel upgrade, but how much energy am I losing at the same time? So here's, here's another way to think about this. Um, think of each of these faucets as the sunlight. Um, the more intense the sun, the faster the water's flowing. And think of uh, each of the cups that are below it as microinverters. Okay, so they each have a capacity, right? It can, each cup can only hold so much water. So in the morning, the panels that are eastern facing are going to have a higher flow. And in this case, they're going to overflow. So that would be panels uh, two and five here. You're, you're putting out too much uh, energy, or in this case, too much water, more than what the cup or the microinverter can handle, that excess is lost. Um, your western facing panels in the morning are slower, and they're not even filling up, let alone overflowing but they're not able to compensate for the Eastern facing ones. So they're, they're producing less than uh, a full uh, capacity where your East facing panels are over capacity and are losing that extra energy. This is clipping in a nutshell. Another thing you commonly hear with microinverters is that they don't have a single point of failure. Uh, is that true? So this is your, a, a very badly drawn, uh, I'll, I'll admit I'm not the most uh, computer savvy, uh, diagram of how a microinverter system works. So in this case, I have four, you know, this, this could be 34 panels here, but behind each panel, you have a microinverter. They all come together into a combiner box. And that combiner box then connects into your, your home or the grid, whether that's through a main panel, whether that's through a line side tap, however it is, they connect somehow. So you lose a microinverter. Your result, you've lost a panel. You lose two microinverters, you've lost two panels. Uh, if you have 100 panels, 100 microinverters, you lose one, you're down 1%. But what happens when you lose your combiner box? Now the system's down. What happens when you lose your connection? If something goes wrong there, you have a fault, you have a burnt out breaker, your system's down. So is it true that there's no single point of failure? Absolutely not. Um, is it true that losing a microinverter is less catastrophic than losing a system inverter? Absolutely. So now we're going to switch over to the optimized central inverters. What are the benefits of these? Um, with this system, every panel's output is optimized. It adjusts the voltage to follow the mean power point tracking of the inverter. In English, that basically just means that the voltage is adjusted to what the inverter is able to most efficiently handle, allowing each panel to produce independently. Um, central inverters tend to also be more efficient in the conversion from DC to AC, meaning of the energy you produce, more of it is realized, more of it is usable by your home. Um, also, the inverter is sized on the maximum realistic system production as a whole, rather than the maximum individual panel production. We'll cover this here in a second. Um, and they're also easier to service. So the inverter is typically a small... Uh, shoebox size box typically usually mounted chest height on an exterior wall. 
no tunneling under panels. Should it go bad, it's right there. Uh, fairly easy replacement. But of course, they do have drawbacks. So optimizers are relying on the output of the other panels in the string to boost the voltage of the underproducing panel. 99% of the time, works awesome. But if you've got those small erratic arrays where you've got two panels here, two there, two there, all over the place, you know, those complicated roofs, they don't compensate as well. Um, as if you have a larger array with multiple panels in a row, all facing same orientation, um, that allows a good compensation. Also, there's a lower expected lifespan. Um, being that they are processing the whole system's production, there is more heat generated, more wear and tear. Um, typically, they're warranted from 12 to 25 years uh, from the manufacturer. So how do you size a central inverter? Um, when we talked about microinverters, we talked about the output from the individual panel. Here, we're looking at the maximum expected output of the whole system. Cool part here is this allows for oversizing where the DC rating of the system or the size of your solar array is larger than the AC rating of the inverter because not all the panels are going to be producing at peak at the same time. What is your maximum real-time expected output? Um, because of this, we've got smaller AC ratings with equal or higher energy production. That means you have less infrastructure improvements needed. You can sometimes avoid main panel upgrades going this route. Also, if you size it properly, these inverters are not prone to clipping. So we'll look at the same project. If you remember, it's a 16.8 kilowatt system. They're 400 watt panels. Um, in the morning hours, the east is the most productive as we talked about. Midday, they're sharing the load. And in the west, uh, in the afternoon, the west is the most productive. But rather than needing to figure out how much each panel could put out at peak, what is the system putting out at peak? So in the morning, as we mentioned, the east is producing, in the afternoon, the west, but they can offset each other. Let's look at this faucet example again. This helps to explain it a little easier. Remember, the faucets are the intensity of sunlight. The more intense the sun, the faster the water is flowing. The bucket here is the size of your inverter. So in the morning, you have your, your higher flow in the east. We'll call that the first three uh, faucets here. Those are going to be flowing at a higher rate but your Western panels are gonna be flowing at a slower rate. So they're gonna be flowing even less. The result is that you're catching all of this extra production from your higher producing panels, but you're compensating for it with the underproduction of your West facing panels. You don't have anything spilled because you're not exceeding the total system size. So rather than those individual buckets flowing, everything still is caught here. So how do you size it? Um, we mentioned before, you're sizing on the total system. You can go up to 130% oversizing, generally speaking. Um, that's gen generally thought as the uh, acceptable limit. Although my personal opinion for optimal systems, optimally laid out arrays, so things like ground mounts, um, large unobstructed south facing roofs with no shading, um, I like to minimize that, that oversizing because I, I really don't want to lose any of the production um, and, you know, just a disclaimer, I work in Florida. We've got very intense sunlight. We also can almost always do a line side tap. So main panel upgrades are not a common concern for me. Um, on the flip side, if we had a below average layout, let's say we've got some panels on the north, um, we've got some shading, structural shading trees, you're, or you're a single story home next to a two story, things like that, um, it would be reasonable to even oversize it further. It's your job as a solar pro to figure out what is the maximum expected realistic real-time output of this system. So you, you end up having a smaller AC rating um, on your system because you have a smaller inverter, but it's capturing a higher percentage of your energy production. That means you don't have to choose between a main panel upgrade or minimizing clipping. It, it's not one or the other in this case. Another advantage here is you can add on a DC coupled battery. Uh, with a DC coupled battery, you can actually oversize up to 200% because if your system produces more than what the inverter is capable of, that extra energy that's in DC still coming off the roof can simply bypass the inverter and go straight into the battery rather than being lost. We will have a future video on this topic specifically. So let's look at the real world performance. Um, in picture one, we have an optimizer system. Picture two, we have micro inverters. Um, and as you can see, panel two is shaded. So you have the boosted voltage here uh, of this jagged line, 
and you're producing, let's say, we'll call that 100%, we'll call that 70%, 100, 100, 100. You've got pretty good production here uh, out of your system. This shading could be a leaf, this shading could be some bird poop, whatever it is, you've got one panel shaded. On the flip side, if we have a microinverter system, you have that same shading on panel two. Problem is you don't have anything boosting the voltage and your microinverters were undersized relative to the uh, panel size. So you're already starting out with a maximum of, we'll call that, we'll say 80%, um, a maximum of 80% on each panel. So rather than 100, you've got 80, we'll call that 50, 80, 80, 80, 80. The result is that you have less um, total energy obtained. Um, and in real world in studies, they find that optimized systems tend to uh, have, I believe it was three to four days more uh, energy production over the course of a year compared to microinverter systems. Long story short, these are simply two tools to accomplish the same job, but in a very different way. Your job as a solar pro is to apply the right tool for the right job, most importantly here, without bias. These are two tools, they do the same thing. I cannot emphasize that enough, but in a different way. So you may have one project where microinverter is better. You may have another project where an optimized central inverter is better. Your job and the reason you're getting paid is to figure that out and to give your clients the right advice without having your personal biases uh, take part. Any questions, I can be reached here in the comments by email. Um, there's my phone number, texts are preferred. Um, you can join my team if you wanna come work with me. You got a link right there um, and a QR code you can scan. Um, but let me know in the comments ideas for future questions. What equipment questions um, do you not understand? Um, and I'd be happy to take a deep dive and, and help explain things because an educated solar pro is, is good for the entire industry, helps to improve our image as a whole. Thanks for watching. We'll see you on the next one.